you can even prevent certain actions from happening, right? So you can, using AI, identify high-risk individuals. Maybe it's a disgruntled teacher or former teacher, right? Or it's a disgruntled parent. And you can start to put them on watch lists, right? And alert when they've entered the premise or emptied the building. You can tap into sex offender databases, right? That's public information. And you can correlate that with the data that you have on premise. So, you know, things like that are now possible. When all in, play my cards right. This podcast exists because of the team at CADCM. At CADCM, we make content creation enjoyable. We are on a mission to help leaders create content, content that will improve lives, content to be proud of, content that fosters community. We know through firsthand experience how content brings people together, and we love helping make that happen. We produce podcasts, short form videos, blog posts, and other written works, while also providing support in website development, social media management, and strategic planning. And we would be excited to help you. Visit cascm.com to learn more or feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn or Twitter. First of all, as I look around, it's fun because you get to go and you see this company that's on the NASDAQ, you're the CEO of the company, but you're, you know, it's like we get in this corporate world and NASDAQ and, and all these things and you go to your Twitter and you're a Knicks fan, man. Like you're into sports, <laughs> you're just like every one of us. So you guys had a good run there for a minute. That's good though. It's like good to be back in the playoffs, right? That's right. As a longtime Knicks fan, we've been suffering for 20 years plus. So yeah. it's good to have a respectable team back. Yeah, you know? that's good. It seems like, though, there's a little bit of frustration with RJ Barrett. I don't know if you've passed that point right now, but there seems to be like a tone I've sensed on Twitter of like RJ. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because I think people expected him to be a lot more like John Moran. And he's clearly like a tier below them. You know, but it's interesting. I mean, he put up, you know, decent stats in the playoffs, you know, minus his first two playoff games. So when you look at that, you know, the data sort of suggests he has still a lot of room to grow. He's quite young, so he can probably get a lot better. But when you see him play, I mean, it's not like he's dominating the game, right? And I think the way like a John Morant dominates the game. So I think yeah. that's probably where people get a little bit more frustrated. And uh, if the offense ran through him, I think it would be a big problem based on the way his game is today. He has not had the off-the-court troubles, though, that a John Morant has had that we know, right? So, I mean, he seems like a really good kid and a lot of good things. I'm not saying Jaw's not, but that's been interesting to watch. And like, especially in your space and like you talk about security and schools and all this type of thing. And you have one of these, you have an individual who's looked up to and admired by a lot of people. And he's, you know, we're out here, we're flashing guns, we're doing certain things. And like, you know, I don't even know where to take that, but it lends itself into the culture of what's right and what's wrong. And it's very confusing, yep. I guess. And so, and he's one of my favorite players to watch. You mentioned John Morant. And it's, I don't know, I don't even know what you make of it, but I don't know what you make of it as you watch these things unfold. You know, basically their lives are unfolding right in front of us. You know, you're a young CEO in corporate America, right? All this kind of stuff. And then you look at someone like that, who's a young basketball player and all eyes are on them. Like, how do you see that? Yeah, so... And it's interesting that both John Moran and Zion Williamson are having issues, you know, off the court, and that's taken front and center. And RJ Barrett is just keeping his head down and playing basketball. So it is, right, you know, right. I think we did luck out from that perspective. As a Knicks fan, I'm grateful that RJ is like a, has a good head on his shoulders. And, you know, I think it's really an important point. A lot of these players, they're given so much attention at an early age, and they just don't have the wherewithal, there's nobody guiding them, mentoring them around what is appropriate behavior, you know, when you're in such a public role and such a leadership role and what is expected of you. Sure. I don't think anything John Moran is doing is demonstrating leadership. And I think, you know, that's a big part of it. I mean, if you want to be the guy, if you want to be the front and center on anything, whether it's a project, whether it's a company, whether it's a team, I mean, you got to own your behavior and lead by example, especially when you're young, Yeah, because you don't have the resume or the experience to back it up. And so it's, you know, then it's about rolling up your sleeves and demonstrating through action that you deserve to be in that role and that you're capable of leading, you know, other people on this journey that you want to embark on. For sure. When you're coming up in your 20s, 30s, you know, a lot of people in that age are 
they're trying to grow in their career. They're trying to do certain things. But like you said, like they're going out, they're doing certain things. Like, how did you see that come into play for yourself? Or, or did you always have it? Like, you're like, no, I know when I got to get to work and I know when I can go have some fun, but I got to turn it off and get back to work. Like, how did that play out for you? Because it's not typically, you don't see that someone in their 20s and 30s having this rise to become a CEO of a publicly traded company. Yeah, so obviously everyone's different. I'm, I'm, I'm a pretty ambitious person. And so when I have my mind set on something, I sort of go, I give it 100% of my time and attention and energy. And I think there's no question it's challenging. I mean, especially when you're young, you just don't have the benefit of experience, right? And, you know, I remember the first time I fired somebody and how challenging that was. You know, I became CEO when I was 25. And it's challenging because everybody's older than you. You know, the people you hire. The, right. It's just everywhere you look, the talent. And so you're managing people who, right out of the gate, kind of look at you with either a skepticism or they don't really know what to make of you. And so it can be challenging. And in business, I would say a lot of decisions as a CEO are generally ambiguous, right? So you have to kind of go with your gut instinct or what feels right. And those are not easy challenges to solve, right? And so, you know, you also make mistakes. And it's also about just being able to own those mistakes and have the humility to accept them for what they are and then just keep plowing forward despite that, right? And, you know, you face things like imposter syndrome and just feeling like questioning your own actions, you know, do I belong here? Am I here for the right reasons? Am I capable of this? And I think doubt can always creep in. But I think at the end of the day, it's about having a certain amount of confidence in yourself, uh, believing that, you know, you can make this vision a reality. And, and that's really, you know, what has always been in my mind in terms of just problem solving and kind of sticking to that vision, the larger vision. That's really, I think, how I've been able to do that over the years. Yeah. So just keep going with it. I mean, like, are you sitting back? Are you reflecting? Are you working out? Are you going on long walks, reading books? I mean, is it all of the above and then some meditating and all these things that you hear about and possibly just to keep going, right? To just get back to work and not let these negative thoughts creep in your head. And if you just kind of work through it, but when these inevitable times come up, like how are you managing it on a day-to-day? -day? So everybody has different tools, right? Sure. And I think mine have changed over the years. You know, I would say I've tried it all. And I think what works for one person will be different for others. I think one of the biggest things that's helped me was putting myself in rooms with peers. So, you know, when I first started in this role, the only person who you know, my father was an entrepreneur and he sort of taught me business at a young age. And he was sort of my template, right, for what is, you know, a successful entrepreneur and so forth. But I think after a certain point with the company, I sort of, I needed more mental models than what he was able to provide. And that sort of became obvious to me at a certain point on my journey. And so I started researching opportunities and I found different CEO peer groups. And honestly, I think that was probably the first step in me feeling like I was able to, you know, network with other CEOs because being a CEO is actually a pretty lonely role, right? Because you have teams, you have employees, you have to constantly balance, you know, those very difficult decisions about the trajectory that you're on. And so you have to be able to make very difficult decisions at any given point in time with respect to your team and with respect to the company and the objectives. So Having that peer group, I think, was one of the big things that helped influence me. And, you know, so being able to talk to other CEOs, understand what they're struggling with and how they've dealt with similar problems that I've dealt with in the past, right? And recognizing that there's a lot of nuance and being able to pick that apart. So, you know, I joined an organization called YPO, Young Presidents Organization. That was really an instrumental part of things for me. I also did a program at HBS called the Program for Leadership Development. Because I think in business, you're always wondering, like, what do I not know? What are these other guys? and some other company, what resources or knowledge do they have that I don't have? And so you're always questioning that. So I wanted to put myself in a room with, let's say, the brightest minds or at least understand what are they teaching at the best business school in the country? So I think going through that process also helped me understand, kind of get a confidence with kind of the knowledge that I do have, understand what maybe I don't know, and then give me sort of a pathway or a mental model to kind of how do I traverse that gap, right? Whatever it may be, whether it's in this specific knowledge set or just, you know, with anything that I might encounter down the road. Yeah. Well, you can sense it like in some interviews that I've heard you do, whether they're short form or a little bit longer form, there's a humility there. 
And like, you've used that word numerous times already of like what I don't know. And it's like, you're not out here trying to pretend like, you know, you might see someone who's in their twenties and thirties who hits success really early, kind of like, I got everything figured out and you're kind of coming at it from a different angle, which I'm sure is also age is the number now, right? Like there's so many people at all different ages, like, Hey, if this is the best person for the job, whether they're 25 or 65, like, what does it matter? Like, let's get them doing what they're best at. And, and I'm sure you're seen as someone that they can go to no matter the age in your different companies that you run, that you're a resource for them now to help them become a better leader. Like not only are you putting incredible products out in the market and we're going to get into all that, but like they're seeing you as someone that, wow, like this is why I'm here. This is another reason why I'm here to have this type of leadership because he's still learning and he can help me become a better leader of my division of my group and all that. So I'm sure you've seen that as you've gone through your career. Absolutely. I think... Leadership is about building other leaders and empowering leaders to be better leaders. And so, you know, my role as a CEO is not to have all the answers. And I certainly will never have all the answers, right? So it's basically for me to help my team get to the right answer, right? And give them the resources to get to the right answer and just do that constantly, right? And so, and just continuing to to provide the destination of where we need to be going and then help as we you know, there's always a million things on the table that you can do, contemplate, change, react to. And it's about keeping the the ship kind of continuing to go uh, stay on course. So that's largely, you know, how I think about the role. But that's absolutely the key thing is that, you know, you have to be a resource for your team and be able to to steer them in the right direction when they need support. And that doesn't mean having the right answer. It's kind of working with them to solve a problem in my mind. Yeah. When you're looking to acquire a company and take Ficon Industries or any group for that matter, and you're, you're looking, I'm assuming you're looking at the leadership and I don't know what you're buying, if you're buying the assets, if you're buying the products, if you're buying the founders or probably a combination, there might be intangible asset value that's there. Are there specific things that you see and you can use any sort of, like I said, of Icon Industries as an example of this, because we're going to get into some of the AI-based security stuff that you're doing over there. But are there certain things that you're looking at when you're talking to these companies to say, this is a company we can continue down this track with because they have this leadership or what have you? What specifically are you looking at when you're out in the market looking for the right companies to partner with or acquire? So I think we need to maximize the amount of value we create over a certain time period, right? So a CEO's job is to build a business, but you have to build the business in a way that actually creates a lot of value. And so what I mean by that is, if you started a company in 2010 and it's now 2023, in 13 years, you may have raised money, you may have invested your own money. And when you think about all of that capital, right? And often you could have taken all that money and bought Amazon stock in 2010 or Microsoft stock, right? So part of how I think about my role is we have to create outsized returns over the life of the organization and what we're trying to do, right? And so now, you know, I've bought and sold a number of companies over the last 15 years and I started out in an industry that I'm not in today. And the reason for that is because the businesses that we were in were, let's say, structurally not the right business. And so what I mean by that, it was in an industry where there was no real tailwinds for growth, meaning like there was no growth drivers in the industry. Our margins were very low, gross margins, operating margins. We didn't have proprietary technology. And so it was very difficult to compete. And, you know, I learned all of this at an early age that, the place where you spend your time is a lot more important than how hard you work, right? Yeah. So with that mindset, I realized that I needed to buy better businesses and put my time and energy into a better business. And so the businesses that we look for now are businesses that have high gross margins, that have something unique about them that is very hard to replicate. So that could be software. It could be a know-how, right? Like sort of know-how in terms of how you do your business, a high repeat customer base, which I think is a big thing. You know, I've owned businesses where every day you have to go out and hunt for new customers. And that can be very challenging. You know, if you have a business where you provide a service and then that customer doesn't, has no need to come back to you ever again, it's a difficult business to sustain, right? Because you have to keep finding new and new customers, right? So at Vicon, you know, huge chunk of the business is repeat. And similarly with AIS, 70% of the customers are repeat. And then the last thing that we look for is macro factors for why, why this industry will be growing for the next five to 10 years. What is happening in the macro economy that would drive growth over the long term? And so 
I think when we check all of those boxes, it starts to become interesting from my perspective. And we want to be in that business and, and grow it. So yeah, we, you know, we have two industries. The other thing that is important to me is my management team has to be really focused, right? So it's very easy to get distracted. And that's one of the things, the lessons that I've learned over the last couple of years recently is, you know, you have to be very focused within an organization on a specific mission. And I think now we're very much attuned to that. You have that. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny when you talk about what you work on so important. I think like Naval Ravikant talking about the person at the corner store working hard and good person as a good business versus the person who's working in say software or media or some other technology who is also working hard, but is way more leverage in what they're doing versus this person who's like, I mean, putting in 15 hour days and doesn't see their kids and you know, all that kind of stuff that goes with it. So it's a constant reminder to think about how, what you're thinking about of like, what are you working on? And, and I guess it, it leads in this question that I have, and I don't want to get into the AI stuff that we've talked about in some of the products that you're building, but, you know, appearing on a podcast, like I can only imagine what a day in the life of, of what you're doing every day. You got shareholders, you got board members, you got employees, you got a lot of people you want to talk to, answer to, you know, all that kind of stuff, yourself, your family, whatnot. But when it comes on to, you know, appearing on the news, to having a podcast interview, to coming on something like this, like, as someone who's looking at ROI, right? It's a constant word or phrase that's being thrown around. Like, how do you see value in appearing on podcasts and doing media? And obviously there's leverage in that, but I'm just curious as to how you look at it and from saying, hey, yeah, I want to invest my time and energy into having a conversation here, for example. Yeah. So I think how you spend your time is probably, you know, one of the most important decisions you can make. So you have to distribute it well. But in order to effectively use your time, you also have to have a good team because you have to be able to delegate a lot of responsibility. And I think like, so for me, I've taken a lot of steps over the last couple of years to really build out a team that I can lean on to really execute, right? And I think that's the really critical thing. You know, if I didn't show up to work tomorrow, Vicon would still run, you know, AI would still run, right? And I think that's important just from a structure perspective. You know, it's my job then to take us and say, okay, here's where we're going. And here's how we're going to get here. Here's the playbook. Now let's go execute it, right? Yeah. I think it's also important, you know, for people to understand my perspective, to understand our company's perspective. And I think that helps being involved with communications, having conversations like this is really critical, especially because we're public. You know, you need people to understand who we are, what we're doing, what's my vision and where we're going. I think that is an important ingredient. And I think the message has to be coherent too. So it's just, a. I think the thing I do most is tell the story. You know, whether it's to prospective hires, whether it's to prospective investors, whether it's on media, right? So it's, I'm constantly storytelling and it's an essential ingredient to success because as a CEO, you are the keeper of the vision, right? And yeah. I think that's the critical thing here. And so uh, being able to share that, I think, you know, even with customers, I didn't mention customers, but obviously that's a critical path too. So, yeah, no, it's well said. And I agree with it. And it's interesting when you're thinking about like, hey, if I was a candidate to work at Vicon, like, I would want to know what the leadership's all about. Like, what kind of person are they? Are they a real person? Is it like a robot that like, they're not going to have a real conversation? I'm a, a Nets fan. You're a Knicks fan. Like, we can have a conversation about those right. things, right? And then you get into the details of truly what your vision is and how you treat people and how you think about it. And like, oh, I think you can make me a better leader. I think all that stuff plays a role. Or it's the existing employees, or like you said, the customers or the investors that are out there. Like, I came across this. I never heard of your company before. And someone listens to this is like, oh, wow, that's fascinating. I would like to somehow get involved with that. Right. You know, it's wild. We're sitting here, and as time every day goes by, it's like this whole AI technology has gone crazy. It was like during COVID, we have the whole Web3 craze and NFT craze and all that's happening. And, and it's still out there, right? It hasn't gone anywhere. It's like maybe it's like people had too much time on their hands. So it like escalated and values went way high. But then AI comes around and now it's, it's, it's at the masses. Like we can all get on chat GPT. We can all get on mid journey. And we can all learn about like what is going on in AI. It's in the news. And here you are in the security side. So I'm fascinated with security thinking like, how does security possibly keep up with all the threats that exist out there with all the new technology, with all the plugins, with all the resources and all who knows, right? But like here you guys are and you're working on all of that, right? And so touch on that a little bit. You saw this company, like, when did you see Vicon Industries? And you're like, this is something that we need to be a part of. And, and we want to make this a big part of what, like you said, what story you're going to tell every single day to say, yeah, this is what people can get behind. How did that all come to be? And where are you with it now? Yeah. So I think when we acquired Vicon, it was very clear to me that, you know, two things were going to profoundly change the security industry. One is that cloud and, and the second is AI. 
you know, you'd be surprised, but the enterprise security industry has been pretty late in terms of adopting cloud technology. But that also is a driver for AI. I think naturally now with large language models and GPT, I think it even makes it even more compelling of an opportunity in the security space for what's going to take place. So as far as physical security, there's no question that the next 10 years are going to be a massive opportunity and a massive room for disruption with respect to driving better security solutions. I, you know, if you take education market, for instance, you know, over 90% of schools have CCTV solutions in place. And you know, that tells me two things. One is that it's an established market, but B is it's clearly not effective, right? And so what I tell people is, I don't think clear backpacks are the answer. You know, that's not the kind of experience that I grew up in. It's not the experience that I want for my daughter. And I don't think we want to turn schools into the TSA. That's just not what it should feel like. We should aim higher than that. And I think the advent of AI can deliver, I think, a big part of the gap. You know, baking in intelligence into security data to drive better outcomes, I think, is absolutely possible. And I think it'll happen. And I think at Vicon, we're very much focused on trying to solve that problem. And, you know, I think school shootings, it's a personal problem that I think everybody at the team here is is highly committed to solving. You know, it's a tragic thing. And I think through technology, regardless of where you stand on, you know, the political spectrum about gun control, I think everybody agrees we can do more. Right. And I think technology can enable us to do more. And, and so that's really what we want to do is use the technology to drive better outcomes and keep kids safe. That's really where we're going to start in terms of delivering our next generation solutions that are going to leverage AI. But we see that the implications for AI and security are, are pretty profound over the next 10 years. And I think what's going to be possible is going to be exciting and, and ultimately keep people safer, but also you know, keep privacy um, top of mind and, and a key attribute for how security solutions are deployed. I think that's really important going forward. Yeah. And these are the conversations I'd rather have as opposed to, you mentioned the word political, right? These conversations have become so political as opposed to like, what can we do? And you use the word aim higher, like, and that's right, right? Like, how do we aim higher? And how do we make this more secure, whether it's at any school setting of any size? And you hear about it, like, you know, I'm here in Charlotte, North Carolina, and you hear about the threats, you hear about the certain schools and the certain areas, and they are walking in. It's like, like you said, TSA, is it a clear backpack? Like, and if it is a clear backpack, you still need someone to look inside that backpack to see if there's danger there, right? Is there malicious intent somewhere in there? And, and how do we find that? And I heard you say in an interview that computers could discover the threat faster than a human could. And you've obviously run tests and theories and all this type of stuff. And, you know, AI is going to make mistakes. Like everyone's going to make, everything can make a mistake. A computer can time out. I don't know, right? But how do you see that playing itself out, right? Because some of the cameras, your AI cameras, and they're going to be able to warn you before the threat happens with that technology. So like pick a setting, like whether it's, you've already talked with schools, like how could you see a camera, like a different kind of camera, an AI camera that you all are creating play a different role as opposed to, you know, you spoke about it like on a top level, but like what's an example of what that could possibly look like at a school where everyone could feel more safe? Because it's like, it's like the whole thing when you go to someone's house and they have the sign up that says they have an alarm system and then you see the camera and then you see the light. Well, they're going to go to the next house typically, right? Like, I think that's pretty standard. But in schools, like, you know, there there's vulnerabilities that are there. And it seems almost too easy for these people that have that are, go to these dark places to be able to go into school and start shooting. Like, it just makes no sense. But how could AI help that process out? So I think there are a number of ways that AI can help. I think first and foremost, most schools don't have sophisticated command center kind of response. So we sell security systems to places like prisons, to federal government agencies, where they have very sophisticated command centers. Most schools, they don't have anything like that. Yeah. So one of the things that even something like a GPT can do pretty quickly is act as a co-pilot, act as a school's sort of artificial chief security officer, right? And so, mm. you know, if you ask GPT, to make a couple of recommendations around what restaurant to eat or help you write an essay or something like that, this GBT start to process that data in real time and say, this is, you know, provide you situational awareness, right? So in real time, if an event is happening, you can respond quicker and you can take action quicker. You can send data to the authorities more effectively. You can understand which students are where. And so there's a lot of 
just situational awareness you get from having a technology that's, you know, sort of augmenting your capabilities and filling in the gaps rather than in real time having to go and navigate a dashboard and look at video feeds and try to figure out what's going on. And AI will be able to do that, right, pretty quickly. Yeah. And so I think, you know, in terms of the background, the type of technology, AI can solve a lot of that. I think the other thing that you get is you get more sophisticated analysis of kind of who is where and when. And you can do a lot with just where are the students at any given point in time, the students that are supposed to be there, the students that are not supposed to be there. You can start to segment a lot of that information in real time to sort of help you react more effectively in real time as an event is taking place, right? So yeah. being able to leverage that data to drive better outcomes, I think is, is definitely another key aspect of what we think is possible, you know, leveraging this technology and leveraging AI for better identification and ultimately to drive improved reactions. I think the other thing that you can do is you can even prevent certain actions from happening, right? So you can, using AI, identify high-risk individuals, maybe it's a disgruntled teacher or former teacher, right? Or it's a disgruntled parent, and you can start to put them on watch lists, right? And alert when they've entered the premise or entered the building. You can tap into sex offender databases, right? That's public information, and you can correlate that with the data that you have on premise. So, you know, things like that are now possible, right? In a way that they really weren't before because these systems were separate or they didn't have the integrations that were possible, the sophisticated data processing, right? So I think from a deterrence and from a in real time, you'll start to see AI provide a better ability to react and drive better outcomes versus most of what the technology does today is really just after an event happens, what can we do about it, right? You know, yeah. the post-event forensics, right? So I think the technology is going to move us a little bit forward. And I think that'll ultimately save a lot of lives. Yeah. So this could happen in a business. This could happen in a school. Is the public, let's say, take a school or a business, doesn't matter. Are they ready to say, hey, we've identified a situation where this individual feels disgruntled, where that could have been wrong, right? That data could have been, let's just, someone's going to argue on the other side. Is the public ready to say, we're going to be looking for that? And in many respects, I think they are, right? They're going to say, absolutely, because the whole, what's the goal here? The aim, to use your word earlier, is to save lives, right? And to protect our families, to protect our kids and coworkers and whatnot. But that's a lot of data changing hands. So then, then you're going to have to secure that data, right? Because someone could, I don't know, could someone hack into the GPT and have access to that information to know how that thing's going to break down. So you're going to have security there. But it's just data. I, again, I think they are, because I think what people don't realize is they're giving up their data every day, right? They're logging on Instagram, they're logging on Twitter, on Facebook. They're giving all of their, the way they live their life on a second by second basis. But what would the response be of the public to know that like, hey, when you walk into school, there's something there and it's AI of some sort is watching you and understanding like this person's coming in and acting a different way or we've noticed something. So like you said, this individual has been put on a watch list. Is that fair? You know, this isn't security doing it, but I guess it is. Sec- it, it's not public security. It's not the police force come in there and doing it. So, so how would that look? And then the second side of that, the thing to look at is the investment that would take place, right? Because I can understand some schools are very secure they're very strict. That could be a private school that has a lot of money. They have a police officer sitting right there on campus every single day. Well, not every school can afford to do that. So the investment that would be required, and chances are you need the federal government or state government, right, to pony up and pay for some of this and enlist you guys on a government contract. So I know it's like a lot there and you can't just answer that in one question. We could probably talk for three hours about it and we still wouldn't get enough of it. But when I say all that, like, what do you think about when it comes to the public and then the financing of this whole thing? Yeah, so... I think you you hit on some good points there. So the first thing I'd say is, I think we have to remember that there's a difference between public and private property, right? And even though a school district may be, you know, a state or, you know, local kind of base, you know, when it's being used for a school, I mean, it is private, right? In that sense, it's not like you're being surveilled as you're walking down the street, right? And in sort of a public setting. And I think that's important. I also think if the security can be done in a way that's non-invasive, that is also important, right? And so the threat response to your point around, you know, do you put them on a list or whatever, you can provide augmented, let's say, monitoring without taking extremes. So I think, like, there's levels to the amount of response that you want to provide in any situation, right? And the second thing is, I think 
The other thing that is can be built into these technologies now is sort of zero trust policies or, or architecture. And so what I mean by that is we can basically understand who you are, right? So we can take Eric, your face, and say, okay, we're going to convert this data into just alphanumeric data. And then we don't store, let's say, a picture of your face anymore. We just have your data stored as alphanumerics. And so as the system is running through its data processing, and if it ever got hacked, we don't actually have your local picture in the cloud, right? It's never stored in that kind of architecture, right? So by doing that, you can prevent the kinds of things that you're talking about, where if your system gets hacked, what does that sort of mean? And are you giving up your data on privacy? So there's ways to build these technologies in a way that doesn't infringe on your privacy rights or your personal freedoms. And I think that's really important. I think we don't want to turn the experience of going into, whether you're going into an office building or going into a school, we don't want to turn that into an experience like the TSA. But we want to ensure that the right people are at the right place and the wrong people aren't at that place, right? And and I think there's a smart way to do that, you know, leveraging AI and building a zero trust kind of architecture. And so I think taking steps which have privacy as part of the design solution, I think can absolutely be done. And I think it will be done. And I think it's part of the solution to, you know, make people comfortable with the idea that an AI is going to be doing a lot of this work, right? But the truth is, you know, if a computer can recognize threats better than humans, then we should let it do it, right? For as sure. As it's not infringing on our privacy, there's no reason to not do that, right? And then I think going to the second part of your question, listen, I think that right now there is federal money available to schools to improve their security. And so I think schools should absolutely take advantage of that. And I think, you know, not to necessarily opine on the federal budget, but if we're not going to solve gun control, I can hear like alarm bells going off and yeah. as I say that, but <laughs> <laughs> I think we need to have a zero tolerance policy around our kids' safety. It should not be even up for debate, right? And so if we're going to put give money to all of these other initiatives, I think we should be able to find the right the amount of money to go towards protecting our children. And, you know, I mean, I don't know. I can't think of many more problems that are more right. important in solving than that one, right? So, and again, it's like the answer is not giving teachers guns and, you know, putting more armed security guards and so I think there are smart investments that can be done to drive much better outcomes and that have a long, useful life and ultimately can solve this problem. And I think, you know, it's not an astronomical amount of spend that's required. I think when you think about what is the, the budget for some of the things that we spend money on, I actually think, you know, the overall CCTV industry is not massive in the United States. So if you think about just education, it's probably under $2 billion in terms of annual spend. So. I mean, it's not a major investment from, let's say, a U.S. federal budget perspective. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's like, figure it out, right? Like you just said, there should be zero tolerance, no compromise. What do we need to make this happen? And let's go figure it out. Like enough's enough already. And I think that's the concept. And so you said, and, and to your other point, you know, about how can this work and would people be comfortable with it? It's, are the companies, is your company addressing it? Are they thinking through this thing? Can you answer a question on it? Which you clearly can. And I think that's super important for people to understand and to listen to. And I think that's why these longer form conversations play a big role to say, okay, the companies that are creating the technology around this, they are thinking through these things and they understand they are people too. And I think that's super important because a lot of people are worried about like AI, right? And it's like some well-known people are worried about AI. And then there's people that you go to a family dinner and there's someone there that's like freaked out that this is going to be the end of our world. When you hear that, you're in a business that's looking at AI-based security tech and AI, and you're having conversations on a daily basis about it, and people show up and they are concerned and so freaked out by the fact that, hey, AI is here and AI is not going anywhere. We can't go backwards now. Like, this is going to happen. How do you look at it as an innovator in this space that's taking advantage of it in a positive way? Yeah, so I think we have to be cautious about AI. I think we're still a ways away from artificial general intelligence or interfacing with a, a, you know, a, a true <laughs> artificial intelligence. I think those, some of those fears may be a little bit overblown. Yeah. Not to say it's not possible. I just think, I think people are confusing what a GPT is versus what that would necessarily be able to do. And I think there's just a number of steps to get to that kind of point in time. Now, I think we will have very sophisticated tools very quickly and they can be used for good and they can also be used for harm. And I think that's something that we need to be very careful about as well. So it's not just about 
bowing down to AI overlords in the next year. But I think you raised this point earlier that even from a cyber perspective, GPT can create a whole lot of havoc. I mean, if you think about some of these GPTs are able to take an audio input, right, and recreate celebrity voices and so forth. I mean, even for me, right, I mean, there's probably enough video footage of me on YouTube where, you know, a GPT could just go and crawl all that data and then spoof my voice, right? And so I think for the average person, <laughs> that's pretty scary, right? They could call my family and say, oh, I need $10,000, please wire me some money. I mean, if you start to think about the implications of what's possible if somebody can spoof your audio, it's pretty nuts, right? For social engineering and other kinds of things. So I think we do... We need to approach all of this cautiously, and there's probably a number of either regulation or good ideas from a safety perspective that need to be considered and implemented. That being said, I mean, I think the technology is exciting, and I think there's a lot that we can do across the spectrum from a technology perspective to build better products, build better services, augment human abilities, make people TEDx engineers build quicker, build faster, build smarter. And I think that's exciting, I think, from a business perspective and from a technology perspective, is really just seeing all of the different possibilities here. So it's definitely an exciting thing and a little bit scary at the same time. So I think it's just about kind of going in eyes wide open and cautiously optimistic. Yeah, and having good people behind it, right? Like the innovators behind this technology that are doing good things and are talking like how you're talking. Like, yeah, you could just tell like, this is just not you dropping a line and, it's not, a, I don't get that vibe whatsoever. And I think that's super important for people to hear that kind of like I said before. So fascinating stuff, man. I could talk about this stuff for hours and hopefully we can continue to catch up and see what you're doing at Vicon Industries and all the other companies that you're doing. How do we learn about Vicon? How do we learn about Semtrax and yourself and connecting with you? Yeah, I mean, you can see me, you know, writing about the Knicks or other topics on Twitter. So <laughs> I love it. At Sagar Global. You can also learn more about the company at semtrex.com, C-E-M-T-R-E-X.com and our subsidiary of Vicon at vicon-security.com, you know, to get the latest information in terms of what we're up to. So, yeah. That's awesome. Sagar, I appreciate it, man. This is fantastic. This is good stuff. We'll stay in touch and thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me, Eric. Appreciate it. In case you haven't noticed, we love podcasts. In fact, we love building podcasts, everything from development to production. Because of all that, we're building a one-of-a-kind podcast network. If you have a podcast or looking to launch a new podcast, then we should talk. You can message me on Twitter at Eric underscore Kaz or hit us up any way that works for you. Let's talk about your podcast joining this one-of-a-kind podcast network.